Hi everyone, my name is Nicola Penfold and I am the author of Where the World Turns Wild, which is published by Little Tiger Press. So thank you Little Tiger for inviting me onto your YouTube channel and I'm going to read a little bit of my book today. First of all, I'm just going to tell you a really, a really little bit about it, um, because my book is set in an imagined future where, because of a horrible disease, um, people live in cities and no trees and no animals and no birds and barely any plants are allowed. And that's because the disease in my book is carried by ticks. So to protect themselves, people live in cities and they have banished nature. So it's a very, um, it's a very bleak existence actually um, and the city that I focus on is particularly bleak it's very very strict there are lots of rules that people have to live by um, it's really not a very nice place to live and Juniper my main character she's 13 years old is is planning an escape and she escapes from the city with her little brother Bear who is six years old um, and they escape because because they want to go into a wild place they've had enough of the city but also because they have to because something happens in the first half and life becomes very dangerous for them um, and they are going north they are journeying north to see their parents who still live they think in a secret community in the north of the country and it's called Ennerdale and Ennerdale is actually a real place you know I've totally made up this story but Ennerdale is a real place in Cumbria in the Lake District um, there's a lake it's surrounded by mountains it's really really beautiful um, and that's where Juniper and Bear are traveling to um, so I'm not going to read about a disease because we've all had enough of that and I'm not going to read about life in the city because those of us um, who are locked down in cities at the moment I'm in London um, I think we all we all we all are probably missing some wild places. So I'm going to take you straight to the wild. Um, Juniper and Bear have escaped. They've left their grandmother behind, Annie Rose, and they've left um, their best friend Etienne. Um, and they're probably quite scared about the journey ahead. I think, um, and they're tired because they had they had to, they escaped over a buffer zone that surrounds the city, which is a very kind of a dead zone around the city where it's sprayed with um, insecticide and herbicide so no plants can grow back and, and no insects can come, come over, certainly not the ticks, which is what everyone's scared of. Um, so I think that's probably all you need to know. The main thing is, I think, to keep in mind is that Juniper and Bear have not seen trees for a very long time. They haven't seen birds, they haven't heard birds sing. Um, they haven't seen any wild animals. They do know about these things um, because of some old books that they have in their apartment that their grandmother has kept for them. But they they haven't seen or experienced these things for a very, very long time indeed. So the natural world world is, is, is special in this book. Um, okay, so we're gonna go into the wild. Chapter 30. Some bird is calling above us. This high-pitched trill, little snatches of song that stop, only to start up again a moment or so later. Bears out of his sleeping bag already, and I clamber up next to him. I want to say something, but I can't find the words. And anyway, it doesn't matter because I know Bear's feeling it too. Anyone would. The scale of it, the trees right up into the sky, all green and yellow and gold, and the sunlight filtering through them dancing down on our upturned faces. It's like the palm house, only a hundred times greener, a thousand times more fresh. That first bird still singing, but there are different birds too, their songs weaving together. It's beautiful, but it's more than beautiful. It's alive. It worked, Bear says. We did it. Not that Jew, Bear's half irritated. The rewild. I worried it was made up. Made up? That nature hadn't grown back, that it was still all dead. Yes, I say softly, it worked. Nature found a way. Look at the spider webs, Juniper. They're just like your drawings. I stare at them, these ornate, perfect hangings, geometry strung between branches. Some have spiders in them, these eight-legged creatures that aren't ticks, but you're meant to be scared of anyway. There's a spider still spinning, 
this incredible, graceful thing with long legs. Her web spirals out from the centre and she walks it like a circus performer, like an acrobat. I wish I could tell Annie Rose about it, Bear says, and Etienne. Why did he have the GPS if he knew he could never leave Juniper? His nose is crinkly. I keep my voice flat. He hoped things would change one day, that the disease would burn itself out, or maybe scientists would make that vaccine. Or maybe, if things got so bad, if it was a choice between the disease or the institute, then Etienne would run into the wild anyway, even though he knew he wouldn't last out here. But I don't say that last bit. Out here, the city feels like a bad dream. There's a sudden yelp from Bear. Ow, Jew, something bit me. He's wandered into a clump of green, straggly plants. I think it was a snake, Juniper. It's burning. Burning? A snake? I say, moving towards him, into the plants, reaching out for his hand. Juniper, Bear says, indignant. Do something. What if it was a tick? I look at his hand again, where little round pimples are rising out of his skin. And then I look at the plants, and I feel a pricking on my hands too. A strange sensation I've never felt before, halfway between an itch and a sharp pain. It wasn't a tick bear. A snake then? I felt it, Juniper. Why are you laughing? I'm not, I say, fighting to hold back my amusement at the outrage on Bear's face. Look, it got me too. Your snake was standing on it. Bear looks down at the ground, all quiet and excited. Where'd you? I giggle. I thought you were the naturalist. I thought you knew all this. He pulls a face at me as he looks at the green leaves around us with their little stinging hairs. He mutters the word out loud, begrudgingly. Nettles. See, I told you something stung me. Well, actually, you said bit. It could have been an adder juniper, and then you wouldn't be laughing. Or something worse. He's wading out of the nettles furiously. It's all right for you with your boots. I've just got my school shoes. I'm stung all over my ankles as well. Oh, bear, I say sweetly, trying to keep a straight face. Isn't there some leaf that's meant to help with nettle stings? Don't you remember? In first aid naturally? The dock leaf, he says, slowly, like he's talking to an idiot. That's right, I'll find us some. You wouldn't even know what they look like, Bear says, scowling at me. Tell me then, I coax. Describe them. I let Bear find them, veined leaves with pinkish stems. They always grow near nettles. That's the bit I remember, the poison and the treatment side by side. We sit rubbing the dock leaves onto our skin, crushing them against the rash. I don't know if they really help, but gradually the string stinging ebbs away. Maybe it's having this moment to take it all in, that we made it out here, to where things grow and plants can sting. There's a flash of movement a few metres away, and bears up, he slips behind a tree. This would be the best hide-and-seek ever, his muted voice comes back at me. Don't you dare, I cry, properly shouting, come back! Bear appears from behind the tree and looks at me strangely. I'm just here, you. I know, but... But what do I say? That I'm worried the forest will swallow him up. He's out here where he was always meant to be. I can't keep him on a lead. We should eat, I say instead. What have we got? Bear says, coming back, interested. Annie Rose made sandwiches. We should eat those before they go stale. That bread's always stale anyway. It's like plastic, Bear pulls a face. I want wild food. There'll be time for that. Let's eat what we have first. There's a log like a bench next to where we made our tent and we sit beside each other, nature providing, I think, like Annie Rose told us it would. How many miles now? Bear asks. A long way. It's almost 300 miles, remember. Is that too far? It's just how far it is. We don't know about miles and time. We never had any distance to walk in a city. Annie Rose said adults could walk maybe 15 to 20 miles a day, but there's no way Bear could manage that. She said maybe eight miles a day on average. Working it out makes my head spin. Even if we managed eight miles a day, that's more than 30 days walking, more than a month. It will be December by the time we get to Ennerdale, proper winter. I can't very well tell Bear we'll be walking for an entire month. And that's not even factoring in detours for water or diverting around other cities or getting lost. Bear stopped listening anyway. He's gulping in the air. Sniff it, G. It doesn't smell clean like in the city. I can't resist smiling. 
That wasn't clean bear, that was disinfectant and weed killer. Oh yeah, Bear says, opening his mouth wide to breathe in the forest. And suddenly, in that instant, I remember it. The smell of earth and leaves and bark. This flood of something wells up inside me. And maybe there is a voice, I remember. And maybe it is Mum's, I don't know. But she's all that way north and she never came back for us. I've got Bear now. He's mine to take to her. I can't think about all that. I make myself busy rolling up the tarpaulins and the sleeping bags and the space blanket. Bear's carrying the blanket, but he's weirdly possessive about his rucksack and insists he puts him by himself. What have you got in there? Nothing. I give him a strange look. What has he stashed away in there? What couldn't he leave behind? It's too late now anyway. We have what we have. Come on, Bear. We should be on our way. We follow the arrow on the GPS along some old road. The surface is broken up with trees, their roots bursting through the tarmac, all covered in moss and the ferns I've been drawing for years. Juniper! Bear's voice is shrill. Look! It's a bird, already taking to the sky, its wings fluttering and panicked, high in the trees before I see it properly, a flash of brown and blue and white. Why did it fly off so fast? Bear asks. Maybe it never saw anything like us before. I think it's a jay, Bear says. I wish we had my buck. You don't need it. You know this, I say quietly, envious of him, how he can notice everything and not just be looking for danger. And look, look, Ju, it's a squirrel. It's running up the tree fast like it's flying too, grey with a white belly and flecks of red on its back. Its tail, thick and coiled, moves with it like an extra limb. There are rabbits too, brown and skittish. The footprints of before are everywhere, though it's all hidden under tangled mounds of plant life, moss, thorns, brambles, like when the princess pricked her finger on a spinning wheel and slept for a hundred years, like Mary Lennox's secret garden. At first I don't get what it all is, it's just random lines of debris, but then I stop to see the shapes, the markings out, what would once have been a house, what would once have been a garden. Now the separate plots are all growing back into one, the walls are crumbling down, even the metal is rusting away. One day it will all be powder, and somewhere, in the thickness of everything, in the depths and in the shadows, there will be the ticks. So thank you, thank you for listening. Um, this cover, by the way, I must mention, um, because it's glinting beautifully in the light, is designed um, by Sarah Mognall at, um, at Little Tiger Press and is illustrated um, and hand-lettered as well, very beautifully, by um, an artist called Kate Forrester. So, yes, I'm very lucky to have this um, cover. There's lots of elements, actually, from the story. This is the palm house, the glass house, where um, Annie Rose, Juniper and Bear's grandmother, grows um, plants, some cacti and sedums. Um, these are some of the creatures they meet. Um, on the way and um, this one here it's very special i wonder if you can guess what it is she's a very very special creature um, and these are the drones that chase them the city drones so it's quite it's quite um, a tense journey at times um but if you read it i hope you enjoy it and i hope it makes you feel a little bit wilder in these strange times thank you thank you very much thank you